Today, I'd like to talk about inversion of control, the UI thread, and backbone views. Inversion of control, uh, also known as the dependency inversion principle, uh, basically means that high-level objects um, should be decoupled from low-level objects so that you can reuse different low-level implementations. Um, and a more succinct way to say it is abstractions should not depend upon details. Details should depend upon abstractions. Now those are nice principles and it's good to hear them and I'm sure lots of new developers have heard them. Uh, but my intent with this screencast is to break that down into a practical application as it relates to the front end. And to do that, I've set up a simple scenario with a backbone application similar to my previous screencast. So some of the concepts that we went over there are carried forward here. So I've got this app with two pages, one uh, to display the weather in Saskatoon and one to display the weather in Columbus. And I've got two simple models that show the temperature, uh, what city and the time of day. And the goal is that I want my pages down here uh, to render those components after the pages themselves have been rendered. So here's my Saskatoon page, and I've got a template, which is just a handlebars template. And we can take a look at what that looks like in the inspector over here. So here's my basic template. Uh, it's got a header with welcome to Saskatoon, and then it's got this div with a class of forecaster. You can see here's the handlebars template that is getting injected. And so the idea with that is it's a container that is going to house my forecasting widget. And so I've got components here. And the idea of components is that um, this will be executed after the page has been rendered. Uh, so whenever that happens, I can create a new forecaster and render it into its container. So let's take a look at the forecaster component. And you'll notice that it has its own template as well, um, but it's also got this definition uh, at the abstract layer, which is saying that anytime there's an instance of forecast, forecaster created, the element that should be injected uh, to is an element with a class of forecaster. And so right now you can see that that exists in the DOM. But if I reload this page, you'll see that my forecaster widget rendering isn't taking effect. What I should be seeing, uh, you can see in this template here, is um, the temperature in the city is whatever at this time of day. And that's not happening. And to understand why, let's take a look at the rendering function. Here's the rendering function. And I've stuck a couple of breakpoints in uh, to the WebKit inspector, or Chrome DevTools, I should say. So let's jump in and take a look. So the first one I'm going to jump into is the top line of the render function. And this is pretty common pattern you'd see in back backbone applications, where you're setting the value of the cached jQuery selected element, jQuery or Zepto selected elements, to the value of invoking the template with the right context. So right now, if I take a look at what's in here, you can see that it's an empty string. And if I see what node it is, it should be just an empty div. So let's step over that and let's take a look at the HTML again. There we go. So we got our page and we got our div with a class of forecaster. And then the next part in our uh, debugging session is gonna step over to do the components. And you would think that this would work just fine because now I've got a div with a class of forecaster. The problem is um, that this element is actually only existing in memory. It doesn't actually exist in the document tree. And we can prove that by querying the document to grab our page element. And you can see that there's nothing inside of it yet. It's just empty. So that stuff hasn't been injected yet. Let's continue on to the next piece in the, the debugging. And you can see that in the call stack now, I'm inside of my components render. So when I new up the forecaster, then I'm in the render here, and I hit my breakpoint. So let's clear things, and let's take a look at the value of L. And this is where you might notice something different. In the page example, L definitely had markup, and it had a node name. And this is sort of strange if you look at Backbone.js's view implementation, which says that it should always have an element. So let's take a look at that. Here's the view constructor. 
and you can see that uh, one of the first things that it does after configuring options is to ensure that there's an element. So let's find ensure element and see what it does. Uh, so if you haven't provided an element, Backbone is going to create one for you with any of the IDs or other attributes that you want beyond that element. Um, in this case, uh, we haven't provided an element because it doesn't exist. Because the element would have existed if it was in the DOM at the time of instantiation, which is what this does here, um, but it doesn't. So the code uh, path that is going to get set is down here to set an element. And so that's why if we jump back in our call stack to the renderer, that's why nothing's happening. Let's step over it and just prove that that's also the same. Yep, still hasn't done anything. Because by declaring the element at the abstract level, um, we've basically forced any instantiation of Forecaster to query from the DOM first to grab its element, and it doesn't exist yet. So we can hit play, and you'll see that nothing happens. So this brings up an interesting point. Our abstraction, the Forecaster, depends upon some details, namely the location where it will be injected. Um, and in our world, we want components to be rendered after the page is rendered. And in this example, it has to work that way in order for the element with the class of Forecaster to be in the document tree at the time our component is rendered. So this is where the idea of single-threaded browser rendering comes into play. And it can be problematic due to the fact that browsers share a single thread that can either be executing JavaScript or updating the UI, but not both at the same time. So let's say we want to stick with the, the control at our abstraction here. Um, how would we solve this? Uh, one way we could solve this, which is a common solution, is to add a defer. And what a defer does is it basically just adds a set timeout with a value of zero. You can check it out in the underscore documentation. So I'm going to disable my breakpoints. I'm going to reload the page. Cool. I can see that it's cold in Saskatoon this evening. So my components were rendered. But how does this actually work? If we re-enable our breakpoint and reload, so now I'm in the page render, and then I go into the component render, one thing you'll notice is that my call stack is significantly smaller. And the reason for that is set timeout actually removes um, or basically delays the execution of that function until after the UI thread has completed. I've heard some people refer to this as yielding to the UI thread. So this seems like it might be a good solution, um, but we've also lost our call stack, which is super useful for debugging um, because you can jump back and forth and see what's happening. So right now, the only way that I can get to this is by chucking a debugger uh, on the render function, stepping through twice so that I'm into the components render. So this is problematic because our call stack has been obliterated and in some ways using defer or a set timeout with a value of zero is kind of like using a blunt instrument when you wanted to really make a precision cut if you're a surgeon. And uh, I think set timeout zero has its uses. It can be used for complex calculations uh, or for chunking things up when you've got a lot of computation to do. In this case, we really don't have that much on the call stack. We really just want our components to um, be rendered at the right time. So how can we fix this without using the blunt instrument that is defer and still allow things to work? And this is where the idea of inversion of control comes into play. Instead of having the control be at the abstraction level, let's pull that out of here and let's instead pass it in as a dependency when we instantiate the forecasters. And we could do that like this. And what this is going to do is at the time of instantiation, it will pass in the right value for the element so that the in-memory object will be up to date, it will get modified, the forecaster node will be injected into, and this will allow us to avoid having to use defer. So let's take a look at what this looks like. Yep, there we go. If I re-enable my breakpoint, we can see that I've got my nice call stack back here. I can inspect the state of things. Let's hit play to go into the components renderer. There we go. 
and let's just inspect the state of this dot L. And now you can see that it is correctly got the div with the class of forecaster. And if I step over this line, I can actually see that it injected, rendered the template, and everything is good. And this is all still in memory, but the key distinction is that because I inverted the control and I removed it from the abstraction so that the abstraction doesn't have any details, and I passed it as a dependency uh, when I actually instantiate my forecaster, then I don't have to rely on set timeout in order for things to work. There's a lot of good material uh, on understanding the UI thread and sort of the interplay between JavaScript and blocking the UI thread and yielding to it using set timeout. And you should definitely be aware of it, but I think you should also understand the implications. And the call stack is an incredibly useful feature when you're debugging complex applications that you should be aware of. I hope that this was helpful and that you picked up a few things that you could learn when you're debugging and building your own backbone applications. Thanks.